Good evening, my name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor of Current Affairs magazine, and I am here tonight with one of my favorite economists in the world, Professor Rob Larson of Tacoma Community College. Rob Larson is the author of Capitalism Versus Freedom, as well as the books Bleakonomics and the upcoming book Bit Tyrants, the Political Economy of Silicon Valley, which I am fortunate enough to have the original manuscript of this unpublished book here. Indeed. Rob Larson. Nathan, thank you. It's great to be here. It's so nice to be with you, especially because you and I are co-write for Current Affairs sometimes. Indeed, we, it's fun. We have written blistering book reviews. Yeah, pretty, pretty scathing. Let's start with Capitalism versus Freedom. Oh. Your book takes the title of Milton Friedman's famous Capitalism and Freedom and replaces the and with a versus implying that you don't share Milton Friedman's position that capitalism and freedom go hand in hand. But Professor Larson, I'd like to ask you, it's commonly understood that under capitalism, everyone gets to choose the products that they buy. They get to go to the store and get whatever they want. Uh, they're not told what they have to buy by the government. They have what we call freedom of choice. And yet somehow you imply that there's a tension between capitalism and freedom Professor Lawson, what the fuck is your problem with capitalism? Oh, wow. That's a really simple question. Uh, right on. Well, talking, looking at what the Freedmans are discussing there, uh, they're usually uh, sort of focused on what they call the negative picture of freedom, where we're concerned with people's freedom from outside coercion. So exactly, when you go to a store, you're free to purchase all the different goods and services you can see, at least the ones that are within your limited budget. So we say no outside force is coercing you into picking one or another product, so you have that negative freedom. That's sort of a traditional view of capitalism. The other kind of concept of freedom is that positive freedom, or sometimes positive rights, where we look at what you're free to do. So are you free to consume some of society's production and so on? And usually the sort of traditional view that the Freedmans give is that capitalism provides you with that negative freedom from outside coercion, but not the positive freedom, because that's a bad thing. That's like entitlements, like you're entitled to healthcare and stuff. So that's sort of the traditional picture there. So, so if a person had positive freedom, that's, so on the left, we would talk about, you know, your, your meaningful ability to do something. So if your healthcare was taken care of, you'd have more ability to, you know, d pursue your ends. Um, if, you, if, you, if you had free childcare, for instance, you know, your, your life as a parent would be easier and Indeed. you'd have sort of more, freedom in that sense and capitalism because it doesn't guarantee that you have things like you know that, that you have housing or that you have health care um, doesn't create that that second type of freedom exactly that's that sort that is exactly the picture right so and and some liberals will say well we should have positive provision you should have some positive freedom like to health care with medicare for all or universal higher ed tuition for example but Conservatives will say, well, we shouldn't have those. That's big government entitlements. You can buy those things once you get all the money that you're going to get from the system. But that's the traditional view. My book argues, and the versus freedom part, is that really the market doesn't provide either of these kinds of freedom. Mm -hmm. We all agree it doesn't provide positive freedom. Everyone agrees to that. But the negative freedom, like that suggests that we're not subject to big power plays within the economy. It's totally fucking ridiculous that <laughs> we are coerced and have our arms twisted in the economy all the time from companies leaving the country to pharmaceutical prices getting boosted to kingdom come to Amazon making everyone grovel for its second headquarters. That's where the versus part uh, originates. Okay. Well, I want, I want to get, you know, get a, a little deeper into this then. So negative freedom is understood as the freedom from coercion or the freedom from being acted upon by outside agents. Um, and you're saying that under capitalism, we are acted upon by outside agents sort of against our will. And you gave sort of, you give kind of the example of uh, a company, I suppose, I suppose if we take like Detroit, for example, you would sure. say, you would say that the people of Detroit have their, it, it is pro are properly understood as having their negative freedom affected by the decision of General Motors or Ford to close down a manufacturing plant and leave. Indeed. 
or really their whole economies, which is the, the specific import of Detroit and Flint. It, it wasn't losing a plant. It was their whole mass employment base. But indeed, or maybe even a clear vision of it, though, is just to look at the workplace, you know. Uh, when you go to your job, I mean, workplaces vary, but if you're in the private sector, typically you go to work and your boss tells you what to do, you don't go, well, let's vote on it. Like, you have to do it. Or you're in the territory of getting written up or getting other discipline or losing your job. And you look at how gigantic these firms are, they end up being huge internal authoritarian empires. What freedom from coercion do you have on the job? Do your job or you're fired. Of course, <laughs> yeah, and this this is the argument that's been made by Elizabeth Anderson in Private Government, Ooh, where she says that uh, companies in the workplace they're sort of more properly understood as as dictatorships than uh, than democracies because people are not free uh, on the job from whatever their boss wants. They don't get to vote for their boss like you get to vote for your government, and yet mm. companies are a kind of government that we are subjected to all day. But of course, the the response that would, would be given is ah yes, but. You get to choose, right? <laughs> you, yes, once you are within the workplace, you are coerced all the time by your boss. They can demand your social media passwords, but you didn't have to take the job. Wow. So you're free. It's a really great point. Unless you look at the market landscape at all, you know. And that is kind of the key thing. As we leftists have been trying to get the right to pay attention to for centuries now, markets concentrate. It's a pretty reliable tendency. And, you know, as an economist, I can tell you that markets vary a lot. But within that, there's a strong tendency across so many industries to see concentration of the market where firms buy up one another or some go out of business and the others take over their market share. And you end up with full on monopolies or, you know, like Standard Oil all the way up to Facebook or oligopoly where you have two or three firms like the cell phone operating system companies, then that question of like, well, you chose this product or you chose this employer, once that market's down to a small number of firms, there's a lot less depth uh, to that sort of argument. Well, I, I want to go uh, more into the idea of monopoly and the effects that it has and, and how it should cause us to think about power. Um, but but just, to, just to dwell a little bit more on this concept of, of freedom, would you say at all that the the very idea of, of positive versus negative freedom it kind of, I mean, it works, but perhaps we should have a kind of more holistic idea of freedom because the traditional dichotomy that people think of between these two things doesn't quite capture that maybe we should think more just about like power and who has it. Indeed. I actually make that point briefly in the book. Like to me, you know, I should say I don't come out of philosophy. I come from the sciences. So to me, a lot of philosophical ideas are kind of squishy to my taste. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is, yeah, it's a somewhat useful framework. The positive versus, natu uh, versus uh, negative freedom and rights sort of dichotomy. It's useful for bringing out some of these concepts, but only up to a point. Like I feel like these ideas do tend to shade into one another. Uh, it's, up, it's useful up to a point, and dissecting this argument about capitalism, it has a useful role there, so that's why I use it in the book. On, on monopolies, I, I think you said somewhere that, that, that one of the problems with competitions is that somebody wins them. And meaning that, you know, you have a, f if, even if you start with a free market, you start with your idealized lemonade stand capitalism in which I open a company, you open a company, and we see whose company triumphs, hmm. then one of us has triumphed and then we've sort of amassed a great deal of power and capital and then it becomes much harder in the next iteration of the contest yeah. for another person to challenge me and that sort of over time unless you have really active intervention to reset to square one, um, you're going to have this steady buildup of unequal power centers. Indeed. And it's interesting how it works, you know, because like we're talking about this in very sort of abstract economic terms, but of course the way this plays out is with individuals. If you read about just classic capitalist figures, like Rockefeller's, like the greatest one in history is a great case. If you read the biographies about him, read his writing, like he takes it as a slight affront that there are independent oil and gas operators in the market at that time. Like a lot of these figures, once they build up their businesses and get successful and get powerful, they get this crazily imperialist view in the market about how can we clear out these com these competitors? And it's never this may the best man win competition that economists kind of gullibly repeat to students down the 
down the decades and indeed centuries. It's much more of a, we're going to crush this opponent, this competitor, oh, we're going to get them. It's not about maintaining competition in the market in their eyes. It's pretty reliably about crushing competitors, taking their market share away. And next thing you know, you have this hugely powerful, gigantic employer with power in the marketplace as well. But it varies too, you know, um, like that's a com one common way it goes. Very often when markets or industries are new, they'll be kind of competitive in their earlier times when there's no big incumbents yet and there's kind of lower cost to entry. But once you get those huge built up firms, it gets a lot tougher, but not all the time. Like some industries uh, like phone service, like with AT&T through the 20th century, they had a full monopoly on your phone service, which of course meant landline at that time. But that happened because of network effects, which is this uh, economic concept we can talk about. Right. Because of that, that market was a near monopoly from its early days. You had some regional competitors. AT&T found technical and just brute force ways to crush them. So some industries start out nearly monopolized and they just stay that way forever. Some markets are competitive, like your local farmer's market produce stalls. Usually the onion farm's not beating up the guys at the beet farm and making them charge different prices. So some markets are enduringly competitive, mm -hmm. but it's a minority within the market economy, I think, if you look at the picture. It, it, it strikes me it, uh, when we think about, you know, just how much coercion is possible within a supposedly free market structure. You know, I always think about company towns because mm. you, and, and in fact, I think Facebook is trying to establish a real company town when you think about these tech campuses. I mean, if you think about companies as governments and, and, and private property as establishing kind of a domain of governance for whoever owns it, hmm. you really can have dictatorship within a market. If a company owns oh. the town, if they pay you in scrip, if they pay, you know, if you if, if the company owns all the stores, if they, they if the private security or the police for the for the tech campus, we can imagine quite easily the reestablishment of basically a feudal structure um, within a supposedly free market without at, at any point violating the libertarian non-aggression principle or the yes. rules of private property, you could really have a, an almost completely feudal society. Indeed, and it's it's interesting, you know, uh, it, a lot of it depends on the, the scale of that market. In a great city like New Orleans here, very difficult to imagine even an industry like oil and gas, let alone one company dominating the entire city and making it into a company city mm -hmm. because it's such a large marketplace. On the other hand, a smaller town, you can be utterly dominated by one giant mill or silver mine or whatever it is. And so that gives uh, those firms a lot of powers as employers. And there, if you have power as the main buyer rather than the main seller of something, we call that monopsony. So if you're the if you're the gigantically dominant employer, we'd say you have monopsony power in that job market. And indeed, the control that those entities can have over smaller or even medium-sized towns is pretty fantastic. And of course, libertarians will say, well, just move away. These are the kind of things that libertarians think are answering yeah. serious problems. Just move away from all your family, come up with $10,000 to relocate, it's easy. A lot of people can't do these things. And if you said that, of course, about a dictatorial government, it would sound ridiculous. Yes. Like the government isn't a dictatorship because you can, em you can flee, you it's can just emigrate. Just flee North Korea, it's easy, just do that. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned being having single buyers. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about how Amazon exerts its power, right? Mm. When we talk about what Amazon does to like small book publishers, for instance, where they really have the power to set terms and extract as much wealth as the, as they as they want to. Because if you're a small book publisher, you have to be on Amazon. Oh yes, absolutely. And th that monopsony power is a very traditional thing. Like Walmart is the company that's sort of most identified with going to all of its wholesalers who supply all the products that you see on its shelves and demanding just twisting their arms and using incredibly brutal power plays to get those firms to lower their prices. So when you go into a Walmart, like the prices are low, it's not a lie, but Walmart still makes a thin but real profit margin because the prices it's gotten its wholesalers to charge is even lower. Amazon's doing the same thing now across the market, most prominently and cruelly with booksellers, of course. But that monopsony power is uh, very striking. And then again, going back to the company town thing, if you look at a small town like uh, Morganfield, Kentucky, where my mother's side of the family is from, 
There, a Walmart moved into town a couple decades ago, and the town still talks about how it destroyed the local economy and these downtown shops. Many of them were unable to compete with Walmart's low prices because they don't have its monopsony power to push down prices. So in small towns, you can have these conditions where you have a monopsony employer and a monopoly retailer because the town's not big enough to support several big box stores. It gets rough in small markets. You're the little fish there. You know, if I was a defender of uh, capitalism and b big business, of course, I would say, well, you know, you see the destruction of these, these small mom and pop businesses on Main Street and you weep for them because you are romantic and nostalgic. Yes. But what you do not realize is that everybody is getting, uh, on the whole, a better deal than they were before. People's uh, lives are improving in that town. Yes, Walmart may be dominant. Yes, a bunch of places have gone out of business, but creative destruction creates as it destroys. And you have to look at uh, the fact that people do have cheap access to goods. And even if they may be paying less overall, their standards of living are, are rising. And what do you have to complain about? I mean, how would you respond to a defender of Walmart who says, you know, on, on the whole, uh, this town is in fact economically better off for having this entity here. Yes, well, the lower prices piece, you know, like we were saying, is very real. And usually market defenders will turn to that. They'll say, well, you know, Standard Oil monopolized that industry. And it sh Rockefeller was very open about this and it wasn't a lie. Part of the reason was to get bigger efficiencies in production, bigger economies of scale, which I describe more in my books, let you get lower costs at those higher rates of production so you can manage to charge a lower price for kerosene or other products today. So the lower prices thing is real, but it's a reflection of the power of those firms to be able to charge such a low price. It's because arms are being twisted somewhere else. And there are losses here too. Like, okay, that's good. The people in that small town pay somewhat less for their retail products. That's a very real benefit for them we can't ignore. On the other hand, it means you're not gonna be able to start a small business in that town selling retail goods because it's gonna be very difficult for you to break in and compete with Walmart in that town. So we lose those jobs where people were running their own business, which is something a lot of Americans enjoy doing. And now you're gonna work for Walmart instead. So there are some perhaps trade-offs. And of course the firm has huge control over the market as well, if we care about that. Well, can I ask you then, to what extent do you think bigness is the problem with big business? I mean, is the problem um, that you have giant entities or is the problem a lack of democratic control? So for instance, mm. Would it be fine to have something like Amazon if you had a worker-owned or a nationally-owned Amazon set like a, just a central marketplace that mm. treated its workers well and that wasn't uh, making every effort to uh, produce things as, as, as cheaply and brutally <laughs> as possible? Or do you see sort of value in uh, small-scale enterprise and bigness itself is kind of a curse, as Louis Brandeis, I think, put it? Uh, yeah, I think this is something the left really needs to grapple with a little more uh, when we're thinking about how we want to run things or what institutions we want to, you know, what institutions that we, we view favorably. We look a lot at co-ops and smaller uh, you know, independent economic entities, and that's great. But we need to realize to maintain, you know, to keep the world population alive, let alone to maintain anything approaching our standard of living, bigness is something we have to kind of accept on the left. The reason why we're able to the reason why we produce the amount of healthcare and goods that we do, whether or not you have the money to buy them is another story. But the reason we can produce these goods at relatively low prices is because we produce at giant scale. And economies of scale and scope are really, really crucial to producing goods in an efficient way, even in terms of the use of materials, like even from an environmental perspective. So to me, bigness is not the problem. It, it's a symptom of the problem of capitalism because we're told how competitive these markets are. And next thing you know, you're looking at the big two in whatever industry it is. So it's kind of an indictment of how markets operate, but big institutions are part of our big mass society we have now. And we might not necessarily want that, but when we've got, you know, population numbers in the seven and eights of billions in the world, and people not, probably not wanting, even as socialists, to completely give up our information economy and our medical care. Bigness of production of goods and services is something that is, we need to find a way to run it democratically, as you were saying. And that's where I think the more traditional socialist ideas about industrial organization, uh, like Anton Panikowicz, for example, is a uh, mid-century Marxist who I cite in one of the chapters in my book. 
and he went into some detail about how you organize yourselves as workers at the shop level. You elect representatives to meet reps from the other parts of the business. You work together. You can recall your representative. He tells you what you was discussed, and then you work with them to meet some kind of uh, make a new industrial plan on lines of free association. But that bigness itself is going to be tough to get rid of. I, I think there's also uh, a degree to which people f assume that preferences are getting satisfied through the market. No, whatever else you may say, people are getting what they want uh, when, they, when they go out and purchase things. But I think one of the, things, the important things to understand about this, the concentration of, of, of power is that that's not necessarily the case because big mm. institutions can crush small ones even if the majority of people in a town say, all want say 80% of people in you know my neighborhood in New Orleans really love and go to this tiny local coffee shop and Starbucks moves in and they're able to peel away you know 20% um, Starbucks can undercut the existing local coffee shop to the point of putting it out of business Indeed. if they want to even if the vast majority of people in our little town prefer oh, our nice. cute little local coffee shop. Absolutely. And so you may end up with something that most people don't want just because you have big outside entities. And I think the same is true across oh, countries yeah. where like, you know, a, a multinational corporation can come in and crush national enterprise, Indeed. even if everyone in the country opposes that and doesn't want it, it's still possible for people to end up with things that nobody really wanted. Indeed, and that's a really good point too, because that is, again, something that we have seen many times, uh, pro-business or libertarian writers uh, making, the, making that claim, that this system gives people the things that they want. They get their coffee, they get their goods through the system, so you shouldn't complain about it. I mean, there's a couple problems here. The first one is definitely what you were getting at. You're gonna be getting those goods and services on the company's terms. And that means that we will try to crush these local competitors and we will offer it to you at this relatively high price. And once we dominate the market, whatever options we offer are the ones that you have access to. So that, again, issue of power is pretty serious. And plus, I mean, it, it ends up being meaningless. You know, like we produce uh, health insurance and health goods for all these consumers, but we don't get health care on anything like the terms that people want. Mm -hmm. If you look at the health care that people desire, they want it to be affordable, they want it to be reliable. One of the worst things about commercial insurance, besides the fact that it won't cover anything, so you go bankrupt when you get sick, is the fact that it's unpredictable. You go to the doctor and he says, well, you may need this scan or this drug or this procedure, but I'm gonna, we'll have to check with your insurer to see if they'll pay for it. And that'll take some time to find out. And if they won't pay for it, you can do it, but you're paying the whole healthcare cost. That is not the terms that anyone wants to get their health insurance on. Mm -hmm. So it definitely does have real ramifications on how you get it. And then plus that fundamental argument, like this is how we get goods, we can use that to justify any society. Like that's what dumb Stalinists said, but this is how the people eat. How can you criticize our perfect Soviet system? It's a pretty empty uh, Yeah, defense. so you're referring to the argument that people would say, well, you, you, know, you criticize capitalism, but you use an iPhone, you benefit from all it, it, its goods. And, and you've made the argument in various places uh, that you know, this, is, this is an absurd way to, to evaluate uh, a critique, which is to say that we all have to live within the existing system, the one we have, and there's nothing hypocritical about saying, well, I think that the terms on which we get these things, the conditions under which things are produced should be better. Uh, you know, and as you say, you compare it to a critique that you would make under the, in the Soviet Union, where you'd say, I think these things should be made differently. And they say, well, you go to communist schools, you yeah. use communist products. Oh. How can you complain about what communism has given you? Dumb leftists. Why don't you be realistic? Yeah, it's pretty shallow. Um, you... you if I was to, were to defend uh, monopolistic capitalism, one of the things I might say is, yes, you look at a snapshot in time where there are a few big firms that are dominating particular industries, but there's no reason to believe that those firms will always dominate. The firms that dominate now aren't the ones that dominated 100 years ago. I've seen people say before, ah, the rich people who are at the top of the Forbes 400 list today are, you know, they're not the same people they were 30 years ago. There's this constant 
churn. And, you know, yeah, it's true that people win the market in the short term, but in the long term, you know, Google dominates search today. Why does Google have to dominate search tomorrow? Yeah. Well, there's a number of real reasons to expect them to remain dominant. But it's that very first point about how, you know, some firms were super dominant 30 years ago and much less so today, and exactly the wealthy families too. This is an extremely accurate point, but it goes to show how far people are willing to intellectually descend to defend capitalism. Like, m ruling families of monarchies gradually turn over too. If you look at, say, the world, see, it was the Tudors and now it's the Plantagenets or whatever. I don't know the kings. You could, that's not an argument that the king's not powerful and that the crown doesn't have power. It's just showing that there's gradual turnover and who specifically is at that height of power. I think the same is true in markets too. Like yeah, 30 years ago, the Wall Street banks and the oil companies and Walmart and some of the cigarette companies were at the very top of the market economy with the biggest, most powerful firms. Now, you know, Wall Street's still big, but some of the other firms have declined relative to the others. That doesn't prove they're not powerful, mm -hmm. that there's any kind of time limit on how powerful they are, which may or may not be present. And plus, too, it's amazing to me, so many economists will say, well, yes, Microsoft had a monopoly, Google has a mobile search monopoly, Standard Oil had a monopoly, but they didn't last. Mm -hmm. A couple years later, they're gone. Like Those monopolies last for decades, though. Like mm -hmm. Microsoft's monopoly over desktop operating systems, that went on for 25, I mean, well, really, it's still going on, just matters a little less in the mobile era. Standard Oil's went on for decades and decades until the government broke them up. Like, great, they only last several decades. That's enough to really do a lot of damage. <laughs> like, I don't think that's a great defense. But also, getting back to what you were saying there, um, firms like Google especially, and we mentioned AT&T earlier, you know, different markets, we produce a lot of really different goods and services. So they have different dynamics that sort of shape how they evolve and how uh, the market performs over time. One interesting one that's related to those markets is what we call network effects. Right. And many markets, network effects are completely irrelevant. Again, it depends on the industry. But some goods and services are uh, distributed through some form of a network. Okay. And when that's present, it has unique market effects. So at and is a classic case because yeah. it's a nice, simple technology. If you buy a pair of sneakers, say you buy some Reeboks, and then I buy a pair of Reeboks, it, that has no effect on your shoes. Your shoes don't get more valuable because I bought a pair of them. On the other hand, if you have a telephone, like back in the at and days, you had one mounted on your wall, if you have the first phone, great, it's useless. Call yourself, I guess. As soon as a few other people get phones connected through a telecommunications network with you, now your phone is useful. You can call some people or businesses or public agencies. Mm -hmm. And as more people got wired and as the nation got connected to the phone network, the value of that phone on your wall grew and grew because you could potentially communicate with larger and larger numbers of parties. So the weird nature of those markets with networks is you get these network effects, and one of the main ones is there's a need for compatibility, for people to have the same sort of technology so that they can communicate one with another. Uh -huh. And also that tendency that um, networks that have more users are more attractive to other users. Right. No so, one wants to get on a Facebook that none of your friends are on. You want to sure. get on the one that all your buddies are on. So this is this. So what you're describing is the thing whereby um, if at the beginning of Facebook it's easy to start a Facebook because it doesn't exist. So Mark Zuckerberg can start it with 300 Harvard students and then expand to add a few hundred Stanford students and then, and then build up Facebook into what it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and that, at that point, it's very competitive in that if someone else had tried to start Facebook at that time, mm -hmm. you know, there would have been a real fight. But someone then would have won that fight. Mm -hmm. And when they win that fight and Facebook gets to the point that it is at today, um, it is almost impossible to start a an alternative to Facebook because it has, I don't know, like like a quarter of the world's population on it, mm. and there's just no way to lure the amount of people that it takes to reach the 
tipping point of having a, a viable social network unless you have tons and tons of money at the start. Indeed, and maybe not even then. But mm -hmm. that's exactly right. The big thing about network markets is they have an unusually strong tendency toward monopoly and a single standardized firm with some major hub acting as what we call a platform, where its main value is simply it brings together producers of content and users of different types, and its just main value is that it's magnetic and attracts everybody. So even though monopoly is this long story within capitalism, I mean, oil, steel, cigarettes, uh, phone service, medical devices, lots of monopoly in the history of capitalism, but network effects markets are almost guaranteed to monopolize very quickly. And what you said about social media is exactly right. Like back in the turn of the century when uh, Facebook and social media were sort of rising as America got more broadband access, there were other social networking firms. And some folks will remember uh, MySpace and Friendster and so on. Friendster found it couldn't scale fast enough. Mm -hmm. As these companies grow because of network effects, people pile in. And if you can't pour money into servers to keep people's dumb, vain Facebook pages loading properly, they'll turn away. And that's what happened to Friendster. Uh, Rupert Murdoch bought MySpace and filled it with ads and made it slow to load. People hate that. And network effects did the rest. And now you have a monopoly there. So that's the unique nature of those industries. Well, so in this upcoming book, Bit Tyrants, um, I, I, you're, one of the things that is, is that network effects are one of the most... Um, uh, one of the major themes of this book. You mm. go through the various Silicon Valley firms that really dominate. The big five, five I think it is. You talk mm. about Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and uh, am I missing one? I think Apple. So, do we say Apple? Apple, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Microsoft. And Google. Those and Google. Google. Five. Right, of know. course, Google. <laughs> and you talk about how sort of in each, for each of these, they, mm. they, how they've come to dominate uh, their respective platform and what the consequences of that are. Mm. So I, I think, you know, so yeah, we've you, you talked about sort of how it comes to be that a few firms can dominate. Um, what are what are some of the consequences? I mean, you're saying bit tyrants. Like, what is the tyranny that results from having these tech monopolies? Right on. Yeah. Well, any monopoly. Monopolies in capitalism have you know this long history, and they vary. You know, sometimes they're eager to charge low prices, other times it's high prices. But usually, if you look at them, like the big universal tendency is to want to conquer more, and gain control of more industries, and and tighten your grip over the ones that you have. So, like the first big company I review in there, yeah, is Microsoft, which seems like kind of a dated company today with its old uh, desktop monopoly. Uh, through Windows in the 80s and 90s. It's the biggest firm in the world again today. It came back on the, the computing cloud, which is another big theme in the book. And there, I mean, Gates is a legally adjudicated monopolist, not for having a monopoly in desktop operating systems, because in American monopoly law, that's a legal monopoly because he gained it through network effects. Bill mm -hmm. Gates gained it that way. Uh, but when he used that monopoly to take over web browsers and crush Netscape and make everyone use his shitty Internet Explorer browser instead, that was the point that he got uh, in legal trouble for. So this was the big antitrust trial in exactly. the late 90s where Microsoft was bundling Internet Explorer with the Windows operating system at, Precisely. In, in order to get rid of all competitive browsers. Right. And there were a number of other sleazy anti-competitive steps they took that came up too, but that was the big crux, right? And they got adjudicated to be a monopolist in everything, like legally. Like if there were a sex offender list for monopolists, it would have Bill Gates on it, which sadly there is not. But so there, there's tyranny on that side, but just also to mention and connecting back to what we said earlier about freedom within firms, if you look at these figures who run these big tech platform companies, Gates, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, they're also especially notorious corporate tyrants within the firm, bullying, weird controlling tendencies over their subordinates, horrible cult-like practices, like apparently Bill Gates in his early days had a little maybe autism in him, so he would rock back and forth, his biographers say, in corporate meetings. And like mainstream biographies of him and of Microsoft itself describe this like there's nothing weird about it. Journalists walking into big time Microsoft board meetings and Gates is rocking. And so because it's an ass kissing hierarchy, all the engineers are also rocking back and forth in their seats. This is described without the blink of an eye. 
Well, okay. So this is tyranny. <laughs> well, so well, but let's talk a little bit more about what that actually means for people in the workplace. I mean, you might say, well, okay, the boss is eccentric. The boss is weird. Yes. You know, so hierarchs back and forth. But like, but but in a hierarchically organized firm, there are real sort of implications. First, for I think people's lives, the lives of workers who have to please and flatter and uh, uh, these sort of miniature dictators, but also importantly for creativity and productivity. I mean, one of the points that we make on the left a lot mm. is that when you have these kinds of corporate cultures where the, that it actually stifles people, where people don't see the rewards of their innovation because it all goes to the company, mm. um, that really causes products to stagnate. And that one of the reasons that, for example, Windows uh, has been horrible forever, <laughs> right, Indeed. is, is because you don't have like the people who know the most and care the most given the authority to use their judgment hmm. I think a lot of the time it, 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 you get shitty products because you have companies that are organized badly and workers don't get to contribute to their best ability absolutely and that's a really interesting point too especially yeah with this new book uh, bit tyrants we're looking mostly at these you know tech firms which are sort of known for having a much more white collar workforce, computer scientists and engineers and designers, and often with a giant blue collar workforce no one pays attention to, like, Amaz like Amazon's warehouse workers or uh, the Foxconn uh, employees who put together the Apple phones. But most of the firm's proper workforces are these you know, white collar workers. It goes to show even there, even if you're a nice professional class white collar worker, you can be you know, tyrannized and have your work uh, life diminished and your creative potential suppressed by this. So one example in the book, in the chapter of on uh, Amazon, uh, excuse me, on uh, Apple, looking at the earlier Apple computers in the 80s, uh, when Steve Jobs was still actively involved in designing them, uh, there are a couple of points. And again, in I'm mostly sourcing this from business, favorable business press and mostly pretty ass kissy corporate biographies. Uh, I remember Steve Levy, I think, who's a big booster of Apple. In one of his books, he mentions that uh, in the early, some of the early Mac and Apple computers, uh, Steve Jobs and his design obsession created serious problems for the function of the computers. Like he didn't want fans in them because it made a noise and that's inelegant. So these things would shut off all the time because they would overheat. And Levy describes what he calls design mutinies by the workforces <laughs> where they said, okay, well, Jobs said not to do this, but we're gonna go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> and even Johnny Ive, the great Apple designer, kind of talks about how Steve Jobs like totally dismissed the iPhone in the early days of the discussion and then later took all the credit for it because he's a smug asshole. But that's like it, it really is true. Even a white collar worker, you can have your potential suppressed. You need socialism too. <laughs> have you have you read Bad Blood, the book about Theranos? I was just thinking of that when I, you were asking your question. <laughs> I loved I loved your review of it so much. So, I didn't read it. It's such a good book. Everyone should read it because what's so funny about the Theranos story is you know everyone knows it's a, a giant scam and it was kind of obviously a scam to anyone who knew anything about blood testing. Um, but what's funny to me is uh, what it says about the organization of a workplace in that um, it. Really really is the case that w one of the reasons that Theranos was such a disaster was because Elizabeth Holmes uh, had sort of dictatorial control. And there were a bunch of engineers, really, really skilled people who knew what they were doing, who kept saying, okay, we can produce a really good, we can actually innovate better ways of doing blood testing. And the funny thing is Theranos didn't have to be a fraud and a catastrophe. Fantastic. If the engineers, if the people who knew what they were doing had been left to do their work, um, they could have actually produced, not like testing a single drop of blood for 500 different diseases or whatever she promised, but they could have produced something that actually did help make blood testing more portable. Um, but because the company was in the hands of a tyrant yeah. who was making promises that couldn't be delivered on and could overrule her staff and could make unreasonable demands upon them, um, that's why it ended up being they pursuing this impossible product. So if it had been controlled by the people who are actually making the, making the tasked with doing the innovation, hmm. um, you wouldn't have had the same kind of fraudulent catastrophe. Indeed. And it's interesting, too, because this does continue right up to the current uh, most cutting-edge firms. Like Google, actually the longest chapter in the next book is on Google because it gets so much credit 
people say, yes, Apple and Microsoft, Amazon, they're known for kind of being tyrannical, you take a lot of shit environments. But Google has this reputation for have like it created the whole Silicon Valley work culture stereotype mm -hmm. where the workers are paid so much and they get all this free food and they can bring their pets in and there's recreational activities. And uh, if you look at it, it's fascinating. I mean, one thing is the firms actually do make money on that. They're so profitable and firms like Google that don't really even have much of a blue collar workforce. Uh, those workers produce so much value and so much profit per hour. Even if you feed them you know, foie gras and a steak for dinner, it keeps them mm -hmm. at work for two more hours. The firm comes out ahead amazingly at the end of this stuff. But of course, Google still controls these things. They take and restore those little benefits at their whim. Uh, and even there, like you, Google does have a reputation for more employee participation and governance. If you look into it, there's actually not that much there. The employees still get overruled constantly. That's why they're going on these unprecedented tech worker strikes recently, which I talk about a lot in the book over certainly the, the well-known gender imbalances of Google's workforce, but also its participation in creating heinous drone targeting software for the Pentagon. So the workforce remains idealistic and has a lot to contribute, but they're always moving against that controlling power from those uh, well, CEOs. And um, in the kind of Marxist sense, people are still being exploited and they're still mm -hmm. not, if they realized the full value of their labor to the company, they would realize that even with all of the benefits they're getting, they're getting so much less than what they actually produce. I mean, Indeed. I saw some crazy number of what Apple employees would get if it were a worker-owned <laughs> company. If like, the, you yeah. know, the stake that each of them would have in it if it were theirs, but it isn't theirs. And so you might go, oh, I'm being so well paid. And you are being well paid, but you don't realize that somebody else is getting <laughs> a much larger share than you are for your work, and they are doing no work. And this is the nature of capitalism. Indeed. It, but it goes to show, too, that's exactly right, but like how important that ideology is. Like There is some real Gramsci in these markets. Uh, like One example I like, again, yes, from Apple, uh, if you look at uh, like not just, you know, they have a working class workforce, not just making the phones, but actually selling them, unlike most of these other guys, except Amazon. Uh, Apple has its own stores. And if you look, those stores are huge anchors of all of our dying malls today. Apple stores are one of the few that are doing extremely well and bringing in all this revenue per square foot like they like to report it. Uh, but if you look at it, their workers are making typical, you know, uh, retailer uh, 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 salaries. It's you know, perhaps 10 or 12 an hour, depending on where you live. Nothing approaching the stupendous value they create. They do thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in sales that they you know, affect on the store floor uh, every year. And they get a, such a tiny, tiny proportion of that. But when you read what they say, like they describe in, to the press how you feel when you're working for Apple. You feel like you're working for something bigger than yourself. I remember reading right. that and thinking, well, you're half right. You know, It's definitely bigger than you, but it's not like better than you. It's still yeah. a sleazy corporation. We ran this funny article that I, uh, that I love by Sam Miller McDonald called Capitalism is Collectivist. And it's all oh, about cool. how kind of the things that are criticized about socialism in that, oh, you know, it, it, it uh, demeans the individual and you, you, know, you end up working for the good of the collective, oh, this abstract entity instead terrible. of for yourself. Right? They're all of the features of corporate culture, which is the individual doesn't matter. You're part of this bit project that is bigger than yeah, yourself. You're that's serving right. the company. Yeah, here in capitalism, we believe in the individual. Now shut up and do the Walmart chant or you're fired. <laughs> the like, Walmart chant being the creepy Maoist chant that Walmart workers start their shifts with. I don't think anyone has topped that creepiness level. It's extraordinary. There's videos of it. Anyway. Look it up. Oh, God. Um, if we, I want to tell you, know, we talk about the, the la labor and workers, but, but it's talking about uh, for, the, for the consumer. If someone says, you know, well, I love Gmail. Uh, Gmail's useful. I use Google for my searches. You know, I can, you know, I can be motivated to care about labor conditions, but there are, there are problems with um, Google as a, a platform that people are not noticing or should be aware of. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's interesting because that very first part of it, and that's ex you're exactly right. Like that is what everyone says. Yeah, but it's free. Like Google is free. My guess is they will weasel mostly out of the current investigations into Google, not in Europe, but probably in the United States, because their products are fundamentally free. You never pay to watch YouTube or mm -hmm. search on Google or use Gmail or 
G Google Maps or all their super useful software, most of which they bought after they became successful at search. Public service. It's completely free. What's the downside? Well, Google's network effect is one of the most interesting ones because it's sort of different from all the other firms. They all have their weird characteristics. With Google, its network effect is almost entirely based on data collection. Mm -hmm. So you go back to how search engines work, like we definitely take them for granted now. Just people need to look back to the 90s, as I often say. Back when the internet was new at that mass scale, it was growing so fast, everyone's making web pages and blogs and putting up content. Very quickly it became clear it was impossible to find anything if, if you didn't already know its web address. Mm -hmm. Finding things was tough and you had all these lousy web browsers at that time that were based on simple keywords and it was easy to manipulate them. So search was a mess. Google's search algorithm worked really well. And the reason that it's able to work so well today is any search you have ever, ever, ever done into Google, they record. Anything that people type in, they record, and that's just the start of it. You know, what people search for at what times, with what kinds of personal information, with your geographic information, and especially what you click on and don't click on. So they're very interested in, okay, you click this link but bounced off, so that's bad. All that data refines the search. So the freeness of it is how they keep a, the barrier, they prevent there from being any barrier to refining their network effect. Mm -hmm. And this is one reason that rival browsers, just like rival search uh, social media functions mm -hmm. to Facebook, can't really take off. Even Bing, which is the number two search on, I think it's, it's definitely number two on desktop, it's a distant number two on mobile. It has a hard time taking off, even though Microsoft backs that, which is a bigger mm -hmm. firm than Google, because they don't have the years and years of gigantic right. amounts of search data. Anything, any health condition or porn you've ever searched Google for, they remember it. And they, I go into this in some detail in the book. As Google acquired more advertising firms and got into ads, they got really... They increase yeah. how much they're into tracking, and yeah. they're able to identify you individually and your whole search history and the ads you click on, other places you go online. Uh, just this week, it was reported that most porn sites have Google double-click track, track software on them. They're, they know everything about you now. Let, it's too late. <laughs> let's let's go into what's actually wrong with that, though, because I mean, you know, if you have, if we had like a centralized such thing, we would want it to refine its accuracy. It'd be great if it used yeah. big data to give us more and more precise search results. You know, what what actually becomes perverse about this? I mean, you've mentioned in in your writing uh, that there's been a huge change in Google's philosophy, where originally they talked about how you know they didn't want to be corrupted by ads ads and that would be bad. Uh, their, their motto used to be don't be evil and then they literally <laughs> abandoned that motto which I think is hilarious yeah, because did. it's like if you can't even live up to if, like if that's too hard, it's the we, lowest yeah. bar in the world. <laughs> Don't be evil. So we go, oh, I'm not so sure. Um, yeah. But like you know, so so what happens when you have a real advertising dominated approach to what you're going to display for people versus uh, a an approach driven by you know just trying to give people the most accurate search results? Indeed, well, you get a number of issues. I mean, one is exactly the first thing you just referred to. It's amazing to look back, and this paper is online. Every Every, any Google user should look at it. It's this research paper that uh, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the company founders and now CEOs, or I think now Page is the CEO, uh, you know, the company operators, uh, they wrote it when they were still grad students re developing Google software using public money at Stanford and with uh, national funding of different types. And they wrote this research paper making the point that, well, if we have advertising in our search engine, then some maybe will pay, so those search, some of those search results will be paid rather than based on what's the right result for this particular individual searching. And they said it creates so many mixed incentives that there should be a non-ad supported web browser and they, they say specifically in the academic realm. But mm -hmm. Stanford, like most universities now, it's, oh, you develop something commercially useful. How quickly can you spin it off and give Stanford a couple of shares of stock in return for funding it this whole time? And so, of course, by now, Google is the dominant online search firm in desktop and mobile and has collected all this data about it. So maybe the first thing to say about having this run privately is it becomes mainly a platform for profiling us for ad search, ad service, rather than whatever other potential there might be in a search function. Just to, just to give some specifics of ways in which I think this can corrupt knowledge and really be harmful, um, I, I've noticed something on Amazon, which is that when you type in uh, climate 
website change in the books. The first books you get are sponsored results for climate change denial uh, yeah. books. That's great. And so there you have money influencing knowledge, right? And people who have a very strong interest in uh, not having people accept the scientific consensus on climate. Now, I don't know who's paying money for that. I don't, mm -hmm. I, you know, allege that it's the fossil fuel industry, but the, you know, that's, that's an example of, and say if you had it on medicine, right, on Google, um, if you mm -hmm. have results of, you know, what should I use to treat X, driven by whatever, uh, whoever has the money to pay to say, ah, well, you need, you know, mm. I don't know, fictional drug name. Yes, uh, Zydavex. Zydavex. Right. You need Zydavex for this. Um, and the Zydavex Corporation, you know, or, or a Purdue Pharma is like, yes. this is an Oxycontin situation for everything. <laughs> this is, this is, this too is an Oxycontin You twisted situation. your ankle. Oh, you need uh, to have some Oxycontin. Strongest painkillers possible. Um, but this is absolutely what you would get if you had, and then it, it sort of compounds over time because as you know as as you've pointed out as power amasses as capital amasses um, it is more and more difficult for anyone to compete and I think in the media realm current affairs we're small we're very very small we depend heavily on people finding us through Facebook Twitter and Google indeed and if Facebook were to change its algorithms, which they've talked about changing their algorithms to display uh, either less political news, because Mark Zuckerberg woke up one day and was like, people need more puppies and less politics. And so then you bury all the political news. That like hurts, that could kill our business. Indeed. Because Mark Zuckerberg woke up one day and had a whim. Um, or they also thought about like, we oh, let's do fact check. We only want reputable outlets. Well, if current affairs doesn't make the list of reputable outlets, that kills our business. Yeah. And these are decisions that we have no control over. And if you add the advertising model in there, if you say, well, whichever people pay to be displayed, well, obviously, you know, we can't afford advertising. We're small. We don't, we, you know, we don't really make a, a profit. Um, how are we going to appear in people's news feeds? And mm. the answer is we can't. And so, you know, even if we have a really, really important perspective, even if people would like it if they heard it, um, there's just no way to get through the gate if you have uh, advertising driving what people are seeing. And I think people don't really realize the various ways in which their perception of the world mm. can be manipulated this way. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, so important. That's one of the other ramifications, right, of having a commercially driven search function. Is, uh, first, it's that personalization where years ago Google just announced, you know, we're rolling out personalization in all search. So like your search for you know, your search results for the word capitalism probably won't be the same as mine, let alone for you know, more subjective subjects like that. So like the, the ability to put people into bubbles, and of course Facebook is yeah. more famous for playing this role, but Google as well, they recommend sites to you in the search and in your YouTube feed based on what you have, based on your past behavior, mm -hmm. not just what you've clicked on, but all these other cues that they pick up. The amount of data they collect from us is incredibly impressive. Uh, you go into it in a little bit of detail in the book. So that bubbling is a big piece of it. I think that bigger ramification that you mentioned there really has a longer shadow. Right now, the right wing is going nuts about deplatforming and shadow banning, where they allege that because Alex Jones was eventually banned from YouTube and Twitter, and he still appears on them all the time. They just took away his specific channels yeah. after many years of having a show where he pantomimes shooting his critics. I don't understand how that's not clearly over the inciting violence line, which is a traditional line for what's appropriate media, yeah. it's debatable, but at least that's a standard that at least exists. They finally banned him. I like how paranoid these guys become. Like you see these people on Twitter with hundreds of thousands of followers, like I've been shadow banned all these weeks. They just think that they're not getting enough clicks as they should, so they've decided right. they're shadow bans based on no evidence. But that ability to rank things up or down in search algorithm results, in search or on YouTube or on Facebook newsfeed, the amount of power in that is stupendous. And if you look at it, like the right complains about how they're censor censored on these feeds because the owners and workforces are sort of liberal-ish. Like they give money to Democrats anyway, so neoliberal really. Uh, if you look at these platforms, what they mainly do is downgrade the left. Uh, two, years, two years ago, Google went through one of its algorithm tweaks where they wanted to surface more, as you said, mainstream sources. And it, I mean, the New York Times even was willing to at least briefly refer to this. All of the downlisted sites are on the left. 
like Alternet is a very, mm -hmm. I mean, that's barely even leftist. That's like a liberal site. Mm -hmm. Huge dive and common, you know, the common dreams and counterpunch, all these traditional liberal to left wing sites, major decreases in their algorithmic search rankings. And there's some research on this. It's mainly because of that push for more authoritative news. Like, oh, we have all these weird viral fake news stories. Well, let's downgrade the left, mm -hmm. put more Wall Street Journal and New York Times up right, there. Because you don't want... You know, exactly. So it's not... They're, yeah, they're, these firms think they're apolitical. No. And what it means is they put us back in that same mainstream news consensus that Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman were trashing 30 years ago. <laughs> It's frightening me, especially because, I mean, I know there are studies showing that it just reading an op-ed can cause you to believe the argument. People try to believe the things they, they read, which mm -hmm. means that, you know, uh, I mean, even if you disagree, you'll be nudged a little bit just by exposure to certain arguments because mm -hmm. you hear things, you become more sympathetic with them. And I watch a lot of horrible conservatives on YouTube because yeah. uh, it's my job to do that. Um, and it means that all my YouTube recommendations are horrible conservatives. Oh, they just want to show me more Stephen Crowley or more Ben Shapiro. Oh, goody. Um, and, you know, it really, it really does. I mean, you don't even know that there's anything else out there because of, what, because of what it's recommending to you. So I'm quite sympathetic to people who are radicalized by YouTube because they don't even... It's like, it's like, it's like taking the, the aperture of the world becomes narrower and Absolutely. narrower and narrower. You, you forget that there is a rest of the world out there because they, they, nobody is going to show it to you. It won't appear in your search results. It won't appear in your Facebook feed. It won't appear in your Twitter feed. Exactly. It won't appear on your YouTube. And... How do you know a thing exists? You're not going to come up with it independently unless there is some external agent trying to trying to show you, trying to say, here are all the other alternatives. That's exactly right. And that is one of the unique features about these tech platforms and the bubbling that they create. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, but people have been turning to sources that say what they already believe or are sympathetic to for all history. Like... Last century, people are liberal. They like more liberal newspapers. Conservative, they get more conservative papers. But at least you knew of the existence of the others. Because mm -hmm. you go to the newsstand, there's other papers. You go to the library, there's other books. You turn right. on the channel, there's other stations. Like you're at least aware there's opposing or alternative views. With these filter bubbles, you need never encounter them except as things being caricatured in the media that you watch. You know, and it's fascinating too, specifically with that YouTube algorithm, like you were talking about. Uh, it's fascinating because with it's it's such an inversion of the original method. Like with Google's original search engine, the whole goal there was to get what they called the long click. That's where you search for something, you find exactly what you're looking for because the algorithm's working well, and you click on it and don't come back and click on another result. Like that was their big desired goal. That's how they knew their search algorithm was working well when people found what they wanted and didn't come back to do the search again. With YouTube, it's a different goal and it works completely differently. They're, they're not like the, uh, Google search is about indexing the web, the whole online web that they don't control. But YouTube, it's material they host. And that means rather than getting you off Google search efficiently, with YouTube, it's about keeping you on the site for as long as possible. And what we've gradually been learning recently is that YouTube's algorithm, uh, 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 recommended video algorithm, which drives, according to them, about two thirds of the viewing on the platform. And this platform is so huge, that makes that algorithm one of the most important things that decides what news people are exposed to today. Uh, remember how big YouTube is as a platform. It's incredibly vast. Uh, what I believe I read the other day was that on a daily basis, users upload to YouTube 65 years of footage a day. That's a bottomless right. ocean of content there. So the algorithm plays this enormous role in steering people. And what steers people toward is weirdly elaborated or more extreme versions of their beliefs. Right. Sort of skewing to the right, but not necessarily. Uh, you know, my YouTube feed is a mix of left and right because I watched a mixture of sources. But it's amazing. There was, a, I think, a Times journalist or a, I think it was a, the Wall Street Journal hired a former YouTube uh, engineer to sort of look at how the algorithm works. Uh, and the way it works is it's, it's very juicy. And I, me I remember enjoying the way that he went after it was it was... Uh, he used the, the subject of the flat earth mm -hmm. school because it's apolitical. So it was a good one to research. And he found that by, by Googling astronomy videos within two clicks, he's in crazy flat earth 
videos are dominating his algorithm. Its tendency is to lock you into weird cultish versions of what you kind of came in searching for. And that tends to skew to the right a little bit. But that's this. these are the risks of private ownership of search. Right. It's pretty steep. And don't you find it uh, disturbing how uh, difficult it can be to uh, be directed towards or even to find um, mainstream academic scholarship? I mean, one of the reasons is because mainstream academic scholarship is all locked away in high-priced journals yep. and you can't find it. <laughs> um, and it's, it's the case, too, that like, say in your field of, of economics, the field of, of economics is by no means leftist dominated, yeah. but it is so much less conservative than the pages of the Wall Street Journal, right? Indeed. The consensus among economists is there are serious market failures. Those market failures need addressing. That's, I mean, the the, the center of the field the, is it really not uh, laissez-faire. And yet, laissez-faire is presented in on YouTube videos about economics, about the Wall Street Journal op-ed page, and all of the sort of pot and Thomas Sowell books, the best-selling books on economics, yeah. really misrepresent the even the state even the very moderate state of the field of economics absolutely and you know like any field there's a range of views you have political scientists who have different political views the same is true in economics you always have a significant chunk of the field like a fairly large chunk that's of one or another school that's very pro free market and basically writes off market failures like pollution or power sure. in the marketplace. But there is like, indeed, a, like a large body. Some of them are liberal Keynesians who used to dominate the field. More often now, they're sort of pragmatic, uh, somewhat more like technocratic in their outlook. Economics as a field has a ton of problems and a bunch of anti-scientific habits that cause us to fail to predict every crisis every 10 years. <laughs> so the field has a lot of issues, but it's true, like it's not utterly oblivious to these market failures, but it's true if you, as you and I painfully know, if you go on Google or especially YouTube and just put in just the most basic version of these subjects, you're going to be getting promoted conservative talking points on this extremely quickly. And uh, again, because of that scale of YouTube, Relatively few people read long form journalism now, but so many people are on YouTube. Just this, the importance of these platforms is just and, impossible to understand. And also, like some, something like PragerU can uh, has so much goddamn money. Indeed. Um, and I think people don't realize in free speech discussions the extent to which the speech that you see is really being influenced by hidden money. Um, the I mean. <laughs> Uh, we, we read about the Koch brothers a lot on the left, but it's always the fucking Koch brothers. Every time I see the funders for anything, it's the Koch brothers. I mean, they, they really do funnel like billions of dollars every election cycle into making sure that people see the things that they want them to see. And so I see PragerU videos promoted all the time Indeed. on Facebook. I can't promote our current affairs videos because I don't have millions of dollars to spend promoting videos of you and I talking, even though I would love to do so. Indeed. And you know, I've, 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 heard, I've had people say to me, when are you leftists going to stop blaming everything on the Koch brothers? And I always say, when they stop funding every right wing, right wing entity, it's not like George Soros. Like the, the right has crazy conspiracy views about one of the few liberal billionaires that there is. But then they impugn that every protest and every left wing victory or movement is funded by him, but with no evidence. We say the Koch brothers are behind this and I can see it because here's their stupid name or their puppet LLC on this funders list. At least we're looking at people conspiring like we've got some evidence we can point to. There is a distinction there. But again, on YouTube videos, this evidence, this issue of like what evidence is there or what is this based on, it's even more submerged than in print. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a huge issue too. You yeah. The end of bit tyrants is concerned with you know alternatives. You know not just criticizing uh, these organizations, but thinking about you know what online socialism looks like. What alternate models of having? I, because and I think it's really important to get people to start to think. Okay, about what alternate worlds could be, because we accept so much that well, these on these these giant corporations running these platforms are sort of are, become a fixed feature of the universe to us. I mean, I've written about Wikipedia because I think it's really really interesting as, as a successful project that is not uh, run for profit and that is run by its community. Now, Wikipedia has huge problems, which I've also uh, written about. Um, so there's one critic who calls it digital Maoism because uh, like it, it, it they lament the 
way that uh, we used to have all these individual GeoCities sites where people could individual experts yes. could like um, you, you know give their their quirky take on things, and Wikipedia sort of irons out all the all the fun and all the individuality, and you mm. might have the sort of conformist thing, That's you know. So it might have the, some of the problems that you have with centralized forms of socialism, um, but funny. at the same time, it's a very very different model. So oh, you know, yeah. what would it mean to have you know? Uh, yeah, we can we can complain that like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg's whims are very important to what happens on Facebook and Twitter, um, you know. But where do we start to think about how you could restructure these things? For sure, right. Well, you know, our traditional idea of socialism, like any political idea, it's got different strains. But sort of that old core of it was worker control of the means of production. Right, you go to work. And you and your coworkers have access to all that information that your boss usually monopolizes or that management keeps to itself. And you then together make the decisions that they normally keep for themselves. So you come in, you look at what's happening with your workplace, you talk to your coworkers, you make a plan, you send a representative to work with the other businesses you have to work with to get your final product made. That's kind of the traditional socialist, you know, uh, mm -hmm. bottom up libertarian socialist vision. Well, for online socialism, I think we should just extend that idea to this new core of capitalism, you know? So there we can imagine going into using these online platforms, but not having it dictated to us how these platforms are gonna work. And again, part of the value of these things is their bigness. Everyone puts their video on YouTube as we do because that's where the audience is, that's where all the viewers are. I love Vimeo, but it's mostly sort of a niche thing for media professionals and so on. So we want that, there's always gonna be some unhappiness with the state of the terms of service, even in a socialized uh, online platform. But there would be one where the, rather than some CEO, yeah, waking up this morning and saying, we're going to de-emphasize this and re-emphasize this and fuck all you people whose lives will be disrupted. That should be something that we decide together. Mm -hmm. Haven't we all spent this time making these videos, putting together our dumb social media profiles? The key thing, and this is well recognized you know, when people discuss these platforms, is that the users are the larger part of the workforce. If we don't make our profiles and video, and indeed put sites on the internet for Google to index, they don't have a platform. So when we talk about worker control of the means of production, in this case, we're talking about these online platforms, they should be controlled by their engineers who actually do the work of making them run. And also though, by us users, we should have different means of deciding how the platform operates, what will be recommended, what the terms of service actually are. Those shouldn't be dictated to us by some douchebag board of governors in California somewhere made up of billionaires. We're the ones putting the effort into this damn thing. And we're the ones whose lives depend on these platforms, you know. I mean, I mentioned this early in the book, try to imagine getting by without all five of these firms. Like one or two, you could cut. Cutting out all five cuts yourself off a lot, off from a lot of the modern society and the modern economy. So we should have, we have a legitimate, I think, positive right to have a share of the decision-making in these platforms rather than some, yeah, 25-year-old in California deciding. That, to me, would be the most basic outlines of an online socialism. And, and so that you would want to see, um, I guess, a lot of transparency first in mm. how Google is, you know, a full un public understanding of what Google is showing you and why, what the information it's collecting is and how it's using that to, to create search results. A lot of customizability, I suppose, mm. um, for, like, uh, what videos you're being shown, what, what, uh, what's being shown in your news feed, mm. um, and this, and a kind of, I, I guess a, a, uh, a decision making processes like Wikipedia has where you can join the uh, group that is deciding, I mean you don't have to join the group, but if you want to, anyone can be part of the rule setting thing and the adjudication of what content there is and how it's being displayed. Indeed, that openness is a big part of it, right? So we were just talking about how these social media and these platforms are putting us in a bubble now. But we do want some customization. Like there's a lot of videos on YouTube that I'm not, not interested in and never will be. So some customization is fine, but again, it should be on our terms. It mm -hmm. should be you saying, okay, I don't wanna see any of this. I like a little more of this, a little less of that. 
we should be doing that rather mm. than some sneaky algorithm, which I'm sure has a lot of efficiencies to it, but what it is for all of us, and our, I think for some of these firms too, is a complete black box. We have no ability to understand how it works, and we certainly don't understand the code. I mean, so, that's out of reach for us, of course. It's funny because there's a, you know, more sort of real freedom of choice, where the freedom of choice is not you know, having Google personalize for you based yes. on what it decides you are, but having you decide what you are and what you want to see, and not being manipulated by something that you didn't have any say in, and having your identity sort of reinforced and, and created by an entity that is totally opaque to you. Absolutely. And the other example you sort of referred to there before, uh, like Wikipedia, is a good one too. And when decisions get made on Wikipedia, even ones that you don't like, when the vanity Wikipedia page that your friend made for you on your birthday gets deleted, you can at least go to the articles for deletion page for your page and see how it was created and what the decision process was. Like it is open and free to you. I mean, on Google, they create those little knowledge panels for people and companies and events on Google search where they cobble it together from different sources, often from Wikipedia. And it, you know, and some people have these, some don't. And sometimes they contain twisted, weird errors. Like they'll find someone's profile and they'll put their picture and their name up and their, what they're known for, but it'll include when they died, even if they're living people. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't just contact someone and find out what happened and get it fixed. Because as the press reports all the time, no human is in charge of making the knowledge panels. Mm -hmm. They're made by algorithms, and it's extremely difficult oh, to yeah. get yours changed in any way. It's <laughs> the opposite of Wikipedia. What happened? How can I fix it? <laughs> Who knows? Write to this email yeah. with a bot that answers you. Like That transparency can be so important when twisted wrong stuff appears on these platforms because they're universally used and we have no control. I would say these, these platforms are too important to be left to Silicon Valley to use that. Yeah, right. and Wikipedia has an appeals process where it, right. you know it's like it's like a court, and it's like there's some rule of law. There's some kind of like you know where, when you get banned. From, I mean, I'm not that sympathetic to conservatives who get banned from Twitter for saying racist things. You but, but also like you know it would be nice if the rules were clear. It would be sure. nice if like right. there could be an appeals process and they could put forth their arguments and then we can determine that their yeah. arguments are stupid yeah. instead of like no. <laughs> Nobody uh, really knowing. My favorite thing that I saw with those knowledge panels on Google is, um, you know, I typed in uh, Vietnam, how many died, and uh, oh. Vietnam War, how many died, and it came up with fifty-eight thousand, and it said fifty-eight thousand U.S. soldiers. It's American died. GIs only. And you yeah. go like, well, excuse me, I think a lot more people died, like Vietnamese people, for example. So it's oh. sort of U.S. nationalism, uh, <laughs> you know, filtering into the answer oh to the question God. of how many died in Vietnam. That's so grotesque. U.S. people in the U.S don't pay attention to Vietnamese uh, deaths. Yeah. I want to ask you about another theme in your work, which is innovation. And uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, you say what you will about capitalism, but it pr it's, a, it's a system of creative destruction. Uh, it's innovation. You get a capitalism, you know, you may object to the conditions under which iPhones are produced. You may object to the ways <laughs> in which your data is packaged and sold. But what you cannot object to is the fact that capitalism creates these amazing new forms of technology, these oh. amazing new products. Oh. And you benefit from these and, and whatever else there is, whatever problems there maybe we don't want to give up these things that have been given to us indeed that is extremely uh, a reflexively common response when people defend the system i mean there's a number of problems with it i mean the biggest one is that it's just an enormous crock of shit i guess like that's the place to start probably okay uh, it's incredible like look at these firms and these platforms are what people will point to to say look how innovative the market is look at these products they've created every one of these damn platforms core technology was developed with at least heavy state support, often completely under its process, you know. So like Google is the example I like because they're the most innovative -y Silicon Valley company. They're sort of the poster child for that. Well, Google's original address, of course, wasn't google.com, it was google.stanford.edu because it was a publicly supported Univer research university campus research program that then they realized, oh, we can make money from if we throw all of our principles in the garbage. So that's what they did. Uh, Wi-Fi was developed by the University of Hawaii. And of course, the internet itself 
without which none of this technology would be available or useful to us. That's famous for being developed by the state sector, right? A lot of people realize the internet's original designation was ARPANET because it was put together by the Pentagon's research arm. Without the, those kind of investments, none of these fancy Silicon Valley t tech billionaires could ever have arisen. And this applies to mobile tech, like all the stuff in your smartphone. I mean, there's a lot in there, but a large proportion of the components in that phone were developed through state organized research or through the universities or the federal research agencies. So it amazes me that these firms have so much power. And bear in mind right now, the five biggest companies on God's earth are tech industry firms from the US. It's Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. Facebook these days sometimes trading places with Berkshire Hathaway by value because of all their scandals. But like that's so unusual for the top five to be all from one sector. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual. These firms are so powerful, it's with technology they didn't even invent. They'll take credit for it till kingdom come and everyone kisses their ass based on it. If you dig into this, even just briefly, you'll find that mobile devices, these online services, the internet itself, Wi-Fi, uh, even like the technical standards for the internet and for our cell phone connections. Yeah. All that and stuff like, came from the various parts of the phones. iPhone are like, mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, Mariana Mazzucato who breaks down like yeah. the different parts of the iPhone? And right, yeah. All, uh, state supported technologies. Indeed, yeah. We look at her work just briefly in the book there because it's, so compelling, and Mazzucato is an amazing figure. But looking at that research, I mean, it's pretty stunning. If you look at where, like, who, what public bodies actively researched, or at least provided the funding for those, it's most of the machine. It's the majority of the key, and most of the fancier components as well. So that, to me, is is the main thing. It's all about institutional incentives. If you're a market firm, even one with a ton of cash, like these firms have. There are real market incentives discouraging basic research and development. If you're a basic scientist, you know, when you're doing research work, there's no guarantee you're ever going to figure anything out, let alone soon, let alone that it's going to lead to something that's going to make a profitable product. Like basic research and development and core science, you can never count on those things making you money, and they're very expensive. <laughs> Scientists and labs are costly, so usually it's public bodies that can afford to do that basic R&D because they don't have Wall Street investment analysts breathing down their neck to see what their next quarter stock <laughs> report's gonna be. I was just reminded of there's this headline, uh, some Goldman Sachs biotech uh, report that asked, uh, is curing patients a sustainable business model? I remember that, yes. Um, <laughs> which is, in uh, under capitalism, a perfectly, a perfectly reasonable question because curing patients, uh, it's hard to see how that would be a sustainable business model because <laughs> if you cure a patient, they have no reason to give you any money in the future. That so customer's not gonna come back. You there have been these discussions about how you know uh, treatments versus cures there's obviously this huge incentive oh. towards giving people palliative treatments versus actual cures because the one of them is a guaranteed stream of money indefinitely and Indeed. one of them is a one-time thing absolutely and in economics the biggest thing we ever talk about and I tend to teach microeconomics personally which is like the most market and incentive focused part of the field. We talk about it so much, but it's all like, well, you people want to buy bread, so there's an incentive for someone to open a bakery. There, that's that's nice. All problems are now solved, but like incentives are a lot more subtle than that. And especially if you're a large publicly traded firm, and most firms to scale up and get big, you have an IPO and you put stock on the market. Now you're hostage to Wall Street, and so much CEO compensation is tied to the stock price. You have an incentive to get that up in the near term. And companies do a lot of R&D at that near term level, like once the National Institutes of Health has discovered some new valuable compound that fights a disease, that one of those researchers or someone else will turn it into a product and the company will do the research that's needed to make it into a pill that they can sell. But that basic R&D to, to sequence that DNA, to study that biological problem, to develop the future's communication technologies, there's a reason that always happens through the stupid Navy and the university systems. Those are the institutions that have relative funding stability and they can put that money into the world of basic science, which is not guaranteed to make you any money and is very costly. It's the limits to those same incentives that give people an incentive to open a store, 
they disincentivize you from long-term things. And yeah, that could definitely potentially include curing patients. Better to keep them coming back, like that's efficiency. Yeah, I think people don't realize just how much the public sector does because they often get, uh, get claim credit and how important it is to have you know independent research institutions that are just free to produce knowledge that might not actually be profitable for Indeed. a very, very long time. <laughs> um, because a lot of things aren't profitable that are good and useful and necessary. Yeah. And a lot of things are profitable that are horrendous, like trying to get as many people ex addicted to OxyContin as possible. <laughs> or um, the example that uh, New York Times had a while, uh, a couple of years ago was Coca-Cola, where the president of Coca-Cola said our job is to get as much Coke into as many bodies as possible. And so they expanded all around the world into like poor people in Brazil, get them, try and get them to replace water with Coke. Um, and you know, that's, that's basically pure evil, um, but it's also economically efficient uh, evil. In, and I think I, w one of the things I like about what you point out is you point out not only is uh, capitalism not free, but it's also not really actually efficient. It's not. It doesn't deliver the things that we want. We would want an economic system uh, to uh, to to give us. Um, I mean, we can think about this in in ways small and large. I mean, for example, like having rich rich people having large billionaires, for example, have way less marginal utility on their mm -hmm. money than b b poor people, right? If I give Jeff Bezos ten dollars, it's meaningless to him. If yeah. I give a if I give a homeless man ten dollars, it's way more meaningful to, to to the homeless man. And so the distribution of wealth um, is hugely inefficient in just satisfying people's preferences. I mean, giving rich people more doesn't make them much better off. The redistribution of wealth is actually more efficient in a utilitarian oh, sense. In sat even if we have this very, very utility maximizing view of the world, even in that view, capitalism is uh, very, very bad at, uh, at, at helping us out. Absolutely, and you're right, Like that's an area where we tend to treat markets as if they're highly efficient and you don't make a lot of money unless you're creating a lot of value. But it's pretty ludicrous and fewer and fewer people, I think, are believing in those kind of stories uh, these days. There's a reason there's a socialist upwelling uh, happening in the country now. I think people are losing some faith in these very comforting sort of stories. But that's right, Like the efficiency we get in the market is a very limited one. Uh, in economics, we talk a lot about the price mechanism and how it automatically transmutes information throughout the economy without us having to do a lot of research. But if you begin to look into it, it works by only transmitting some information, like near-term, immediate, market-relevant information. If it ends up melting the ice caps in 200 years, well, I mean, that's not part of the information that we include. Oh, so you don't really transmit all the information, do you? I mean, the price mechanism in the mar in markets is such a mess. That might be a video for another day. But that definitely speaks to that same subject. Well, I, that's, yeah, I wanted to close here by talking about the environment because this comes mm. up a lot in, in your work. Um, as you mentioned, people like Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, these, these capitalist economists, have praised the virtues of the price system and said, and the big critique of socialism was, you know, if you define socialism as set the central, centrally planned economy without markets and without a price mechanism, um, it can never be efficient because prices convey all this useful information about how much people want and how much people need and that, and that sort of thing, and it's a really good coordinating system. You point out it's a shit coordinating system. It's a terrible coordinating system. And why? Because if you look at, all we have to do is, in order to believe that, we have to ignore climate change. And if yeah. we look at climate change and we begin to understand what is actually going on, yeah. we can see that the information that is needed is not, in fact, being conveyed through prices. And you have this great phrase, I'm not going to remember it correctly, but it's something like, it's easy uh, it's easy to do well uh, on a test if you like. Uh, what, what, do you remember? Do you remember this? You said yeah. like, yeah. Of course, it's really, really easy, easy to do well if you're like, you know, you're not testing the very thing yes. that it should be doing. And and so when it comes to the environment, um, we have with the use of fossil fuels is destroying the earth, right? And you'd think that because the earth is people's property. Um, that cost, the cost of that destruction should be a very high one. And so if prices were efficiently and effectively conveying information about value, um, 
then there would be an extre that extreme cost of that destruction would be incorporated into prices. But that knowledge is not being incorporated. Definitely and the not. fact that it is not being incorporated shows that the price mechanism is completely off. You're not pricing things correctly. Um, and the, you know, the old phrase is, the economist is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I love it because like economists are like, but wait, price is value. Yeah. And, and you go, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what you think. That's what you think, yes. um, And the fact is the price is very, very bad at capturing value as we can see from the fact that uh, it's not capturing uh, the costs of destroying the entire world. Yeah, we're just ruining the biosphere. Like we're, we just went ahead and we're just destroying it. Yeah, that's, that's I think, you can understand why conservatives cannot accept climate change because beyond all other environmental pollution issues, which are huge, we have all these other issues. We have a mass extinction happening right now. Polluting the environment is something that hugely disproportionately impacts poor people and communities of color who tend to have their communities sited near or have these facilities sited near them. Uh, so it's a huge issue, but climate above all puts this huge surcharge on all the energy that we use to run everything else in the system. And that's why it's sort of the most fundamental economic issue, because everything else that we make with all of its own problems, all the farms with the runoff and all the factories with their air pollution, it all runs on fossil fuels, which are themselves separately warming the biosphere and changing the ocean chemistry and all this other shit. When you buy a car, you pay the sticker price for that car. It represents what the price mechanism can handle. You know, the price and relative scarcity of all the components and labor that go into making that car. But it certainly doesn't include your car's contribution to asthma for the kids who live along your work commute, which your car will make a small contribution to. And it doesn't count your car's contribution to uh, melt you know, to climate change overall or melting specific glaciers around the world. How the hell are you going to put a dollar and cent amount on that for your personal, you know, uh, you know uh, Hyundai car? It's almost impossible. And some economists, like in the true cost movement in econ economics, are trying to represent that. But that's what I say about the price mechanism. It's amazingly efficient at gathering information because it doesn't pay any attention to the information it can't collect, like all these environmental and species extinction ramifications. So that if inefficiency there, I mean, it'll be a hell of a thing if we stick with the system, talking about how efficient it is, and it ends up destroying our system because we can't cope with the wa waves of climate refugees and it getting harder and harder to live outside during the summer. You tell me that's an efficient system? Like, that could destroy our civilization. Like, that's utterly within the, within the, the realm of possibility here. So to me, yeah, the efficiency part of it is kind of a grotesque farce. Yeah. Yeah, the price system is very good if you only focus on the things that it gets right yes. and you completely <laughs> ignore the things that it gets wrong. Mm. And, you know, the last part of, of capitalism versus freedom here, you talk about the freedom of future generations and the way that even if we assumed that our own, uh, that we ha were being delivered um, a great deal of freedom today, because people in subsequent generations are not having their preferences factored into um, what is being delivered, um, we could be massively destroying the sum total of human freedom across time. Because if you are fucking over everyone who lives more than 20 years in the future, then <laughs> in what possible sense have you created anything efficient other than some short-term glut of luxury and consumption for the for this narrow band of people who happen to be alive at this one given time. Yeah, and really mainly for an upper crust within those people. Even. Right, of it's, course. It's slightly worse than that, yeah. It's true, and I think one way to v visualize this, and I look at a lot of scientific reports there about the world, what the world will be like in 2100. Readers can take a look at that. I think the easiest way to kind of see it for our purposes is just to realize it applies to us too. Like we, in our generation, have a number of things we might wish to enjoy in the natural world that 
we are not free to enjoy because we destroyed it or made it go extinct. So most of North America was covered by fairly thick old growth forest before the advent of white settlers. And I mean, you know, obviously there's a long history of land use before white people got here. But that was the big turning point, and now there is very few places left in the United States where you can go to an old-growth forest and just walk peacefully through it and see trees that are older than the Republic. We can't. We mostly aren't in a position to do that because we got rid of those things, and there are many species we might like to encounter, and they're gone because we drove them extinct earlier or later in our history. Imagine if, rather than that, it's you live in a world swamped with refugees that pour into your country because you destroyed the ability of the tropical economies to function, and you ha can't go outside in the summer very long because of the constant heat advisories, and areas like this that are relatively low-lying have to be like left behind. Like the very real prospect for America with our coastal cities is abandoning major cities. I mean, that's in well into the future. Freedom. We could spend many years building like goofy fences and seawalls for a while, yeah. but especially cities like this. You're like the free, you won't have the freedom to live in New Orleans. Like large parts of it will be submerged by the end of this century, according to the scientific projections that the community is coming up with. If that's what freedom is, we have completely lost sight of its definition. Like that's an atrocity. Yeah. yeah, it's way small and large. I mean, I was reading something about how, you know, people and people don't notice changes over time often or generational changes. Mm. You know, we published an article about someone, a, a guy looking at wildfires in California and realizing his daughter would grow up thinking that was normal and not realizing that what what had been lost. So you don't notice when you, and, and some, there was something else I think he wrote about, which is the disappearance of butterflies in California, where oh. it used to be that there were so many more butterflies. There are 50% less hedgehogs, like wild hedgehogs in <laughs> England now because and you don't notice you know if you grow up with 50% less hedgehogs you don't notice that there were way more hedgehogs before um, and these are small ways in which things po you know positive freedom things that you would have seen disappear from the world and you'll be told that you know that you're free without seeing the alternatives and I think one of the, the tasks that we have as leftists and socialists is to give people a real vision of what alternatives can actually be and making people understand that there is a libertarian form of socialism that is not uh, that is not kind of brutal authoritarian state socialism hmm. and that that socialism is not just this set of abstractions but is a very real uh, alternate set of ways of thinking about what you should do what kinds of institutions you could should construct who should control those institutions and what kind of values they should operate according to Absolutely, and uh, it's, it's true. Sometimes we leftists are a little preoccupied with look how horrible the world is and what it, we're on track for. I mean, that's an important part of helping people see what the state, why the stakes are high. But you're right, if we're not making that positive vision clear, like we're definitely not doing our jobs. And that is the last chapter of the book there, is trying to give mm -hmm. people just that broadest sketch of how we could organize our workplaces to make them less heinous so your boss doesn't dictate to you. You don't have workplace sexual harassment all the time because there's huge power distinctions among the levels that make it very difficult for you to just report abuse that you face. And also, so that, again, we can have control over our economy so we don't just have, oh, they're closing down all the factories in our city today, that's too bad. Oh, that app I used to use on my phone doesn't work anymore because someone changed the settings and they won't work together properly. Who feels completely in control of their life these days? Mm -hmm. I think few people who aren't fairly wealthy is what I would say. So we need that healthful vision of the future. And I think a vision of a libertarian socialist future, we could be freer. We could be freer men and women and we could avoid the fucking nightmare that we're walking straight into right now. I think people are waking up to this now and this is why we're having a socialist uh, upwelling in the country these days. Well, yeah, that's how what I like and why I would recommend that everyone read Capitalism Versus Freedom is that you 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 are a person who's very, very concerned with giving people uh, something something to, to cling to and hope for. I mean, you, you know, the, the picture uh, on the cover of the book is, is an illustration of the horrendous inequality in our world. It's got luxury skyscrapers being built above slums um, and it certainly, it's 
especially in the chapter on, on climate change, you, you know, you don't sugarcoat um, the damage that is being done. But as Noam Chomsky says in his blurb for Capitalism versus Freedom, um, you know, it is not only an eloquent study that c reveals clearly the roots of our problems, but it also calls for the renewal of the inspiring vision of libertarian socialism, which is, which is why people can come away from Capitalism versus Freedom not feeling like complete shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal, right? You up, we uplift. It's uplift. So people should buy that book. Uh, Bit Tyrants comes out uh, February. In February, and so should, they should probably pre-order that as soon as it's available. They Absolutely. should also pick up copies of Current Affairs magazine, in which Rob Larson and I have an article on big business in yeah. this brand new issue, issue 19. You should subscribe for more future writing from Rob and myself. Um, read his books and read our articles and read my books and read our magazine. Um, Thank you so much, Rob Larson, for My chatting with me. My pleasure, Nathan. Great to be here. It was super fun.